Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to our webinar on economic and policy issues in online food retail, brought to you by CFAIR, the Council on Food, Agricultural and Resource Economics. My name is Sean Cash and I'm a CFAIR board member, as well as a Bergstrom Foundation professor at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University. It's my pleasure to be moderating today's webinar. Next slide, please. It's CFAIR's mission to translate high-level research and knowledge to a diverse audience that includes policymakers, elected officials, and federal administrators. In demonstrating the value of the profession in these groups, the Council also increases public appreciation for research, extension, outreach, and academic programs in agricultural and applied economics and related fields. Next slide. Before we get started, I wanted to provide some very basic background on today's topic. Well before COVID-19 struck, industry watchers saw the importance of online grocery shopping, with many pundits predicting slow but steady growth. However, COVID-19 promoted a rather dramatic expansion of online grocery shopping. Supporting this growth was the expansion of the online grocery pilots of the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, with nearly 90% of SNAP households now having access to these pilot programs. While the widespread availability and use of online grocery shopping is a benefit to many consumers in terms of convenience and safety, Online shopping platforms are highly curated environments. The potential of tools like dynamic pricing or online nudges could have substantial implications for consumers and producers. Next slide, please. As such, our webinar today will discuss the economic and policy issues in online food retail. CFAIR has assembled a panel of experts to discuss their work. First, Dr. Norbert Wilson, a professor of food, economic, and community food economics and community at the Duke Divinity School with a secondary appointment in the Stanford School of Public Policy at Duke University. He's also the president-elect of the Agricultural and Applied Economics Association, or AAEA. Norbert's research encompasses issues including food access, choice, and food waste. Dr. Wilson will lead off the panel with an overview of the societal implications of online grocery platforms. Next slide, please. I will then present second. I have already mentioned my affiliations with CFAIR and Tufts University, and I'm an economist who studies issues of consumer behavior around food and nutrition, as well as economic aspects of the food and environment interface. My comments today will describe some of our team's recent work characterizing the failure of online food retailers to consistently provide nutrition information that is otherwise required and expected in conventional environments, and I briefly discuss possible repercussions of these incongruencies. Next slide, please. Finally, we will hear from Jennifer L. Pomerantz, a public health lawyer and assistant professor in the Department of Public Health Policy and Management at the School of Global Public Health at New York University. She has authored dozens of articles related to food and nutrition policy and a book, Food Law for Public Health, published by Oxford University Press in 2016. Professor Pomerantz will continue our discussion of labeling in online grocery environments by describing the legal challenges to and possible remedies for addressing the current deficits in the information available to online food shoppers. Next slide, please. Before we dive in, we wanted to explain briefly how to ask questions during the webinar to make sure that you, the audience, knows how to engage with us. During the webinar, you can put questions to one or all of the speakers by typing into the box on the control panel accessed by clicking on the question dropdown as shown in the slide and sending it to the organizer. Next presentation, uh, next slide. <laughs> okay, we're gonna get started with our presentation now. I'm gonna hand things off to Norbert Wilson who will get us started. Go ahead, Norbert. Thank you, Sean, and hello, everyone. It is a real pleasure to uh, join you all to share some work that I've been doing and thinking about in terms of online grocery shopping. Um, I will tell you part of this work uh, started out of uh, funding from the Walmart Foundation um, to look at online grocery shopping and how and whether or not uh, nudges could occur through this idea of gamification, adding game-like elements, um, to a platform could encourage healthier food choices. Um, that project led me to look a little bit more carefully at the uh, online grocery store um, environment. And this project started before the pandemic. Um, and so uh, needless to say, our world changed dramatically because of the pandemic. Um, if we would go to the next slide, I'll, I'll give you the upshot of this work. So one of the things that the pandemic really fundamentally did was changed our relationship with food in terms of food prepared at home um, relative to going out in part because of what happened in terms of uh, the shutdown orders that occurred in many locations. Um, but that also influenced how we shopped and what we shopped for. 
Um, online shopping um, became a vital space, an opportunity for people to access food. Um, and we see that a couple of stores really dominated this space. One of the things that Sean already mentioned is the, the role that the expansion of the SNAP online uh, purchases had on online grocery shopping, and it was an important space for us to consider and has some in significant implications in terms of, of policy questions. I want to end our my part of the presentation by raising a couple of concerns about consumer well-being. And I want to be clear, um, these are questions that I have that I think as policymakers and as a larger community, we need to take into consideration. Next slide, please. Before the pandemic, um, industry watchers knew that online grocery shopping would would grow. Um, and the belief was that this potential would grow slowly. We we saw that there were a number of individuals who were from higher or middle incomes that were actively engaged in online grocery shopping, but still it was an industry that was developing, it was slowly happening. Um, and there were predictions in, back in 2020 or before 2020, before the pandemic, that suggested that online grocery shopping would reach about 10% market penetration or market share by the year uh, 2025, 2026. However, uh, if we go to the next slide, we saw that um, there was a pretty substantial increase in the online grocery shopping, um, at least in terms of the share of participants um, who use this platform. So we see back in 2018, 2019, it was only two to three percent. Um, but when the pandemic hit, um, we saw a substantial increase, and the, these are data from Statista that shows the expansion of online grocery shopping in terms of share of, of sales. And the predictions we can see look like they're going to hit 20% uh, by mid-decade. Uh, so the predictions of a 10% um, market share um, really underestimates where we think we are now, given the advent of the COVID pandemic. Next slide, please. Annual sales have been estimated to be around $98 billion, um, with a significant increase in the December uh, sales online for, of about 3.5% from the previous December. And this is some reporting by uh, Revenue and um, Supermarket uh, News. But there are other estimates, and if we go to the next slide, we can see what those sales look like on a month-to-month -month basis. And so, um, again, using data from Statista, we can see that on a month-to-month -month basis, it was around seven, six to seven billion dollars of sales online, and those include sales of online retailers like Amazon and um, and Walmart, but it also includes other online uh, food retailers such as uh, Blue Apron and um, Hello Fresh. Let's go to our next slide, please. So uh, some work that I was doing with my colleagues, Brenna Ellison, uh, Brandon McFadden, and Brad Rickard, um, we actually ran a survey um, and didn't anticipate the uh, pandemic perfectly, but we were able to release this survey at the very beginning of the pandemic. And what we were able to observe was a significant increase in the online grocery shopping of our cohort of, of participants. We surveyed people over a six week period, we contacted them four times and we're asking them questions around food choice and food uh, decision making. And one of the questions included, uh, what is um, your participation in online grocery shopping? And if you would go to the next slide, you can see that over the, the six weeks um, at the different points at the very beginning of the pandemic through the first uh, six weeks, we see that there was a 50% increase in online grocery shopping. And this is a paper that appears in the journal um, Applied Economics Policy and Policy Perspectives. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. There are a couple of um, major players in the online shopping um, space, and we see that uh, this could have significant implications on, um, on options and choices of consumers as they um, tend toward certain retailers, uh, maybe more so than others. And uh, there's a, a graphic that uh, coincides with the findings from uh, the reporting of Redmond. If we go to the next slide, we'll see that Amazon and Walmart are the dominant um, players in this space, at least from survey uh, work that was done. We also see companies like Costco and Instacart also having um, a substantial um, a foothold in uh, participation in online grocery shopping. As I mentioned before, 
Um, this space also includes individuals or companies like HelloFresh and Blue Apron, which represent um, packaged meal services that people are participating or purchasing uh, foods online. The next slide, please. A really important um, change that occurred uh, in the online shopping um, space was the um, beginning pilot of SNAP participants uh, to use on their benefits on online platforms. And initially it was only going to be about four states that were allowed to use the platforms um, to use these pilots. However, once the pandemic hit, um, that number increased to 47 such that by 2020, nearly 90% of all SNAP participating households were eligible to use their SNAP benefits on online platforms. That's not necessarily how many actually did use it, but the potential existed. Um, and this plays um, an important uh, change in who participates in online grocery shopping. If we go to the next slide, we can see some of the data that reflects what online grocery shopping looks like in terms of household demographics, at least in terms of income. And at the beginning of the pandemic, we see that, um, or excuse me, before the stay at home orders were implemented, we see that only about 1.4% of low income households that participate in this survey um, participate in online grocery shopping. And by the time the pandemic hit, um, in earnest, and then um, in 2021, uh, a year from that uh, 20, the February period, we see that 4% of low-income households were using online platforms. So that's a pretty substantial increase in uh, the use of online shopping by lower income. While low income and SNAP participation overlap, they're not perfect overlaps, but this data suggests, these data rather suggest that um, online grocery shopping became an important um, place for some lower income households. Next slide. In some work that uh, my colleagues and I did, we uh, um, asked um, um, industry um, folks and academics about their anticipation of what's going to happen in the online grocery shopping, particularly thinking about the use of nudges and other um, uh, other tools to encourage certain food selection on online platforms. And while there was a general consensus that um, online grocery shopping would increase, there was a lack of uh, clarity on whether or not people could make healthier food choices online versus um, in store. Um, it wasn't as clear for many of our participants. But one thing many of our participants, um, industry representatives um, and academics believe that online shopping platforms would be places where nudges could be used, not saying that they would, but they could be used to increase profits even over um, health. And so there seems to be some concern about what this space could look like. Well, that brings up a series of questions that I want to raise if we go to our, my last slide. Um, a number of these concerns have come up out of conversations with um, individuals who uh, have been watching online grocery shopping um, and actually prompted some of this conversation today. Um, the, the very fact that online shopping um, and online platforms use a, very, a variety of algorithms, artificial intelligence to encourage certain behaviors, we are raising the question of could online grocery uh, use artificial intelligence or other algorithms to help um, in displaying products. And as Sean mentioned, issues around dynamic pricing and other methods to encourage certain behaviors. And we need to be aware of those and think through what those could look like. There are concerns around privacy that um, have been raised in online platforms in general, and it's not surprising to think that they could influence the online shopping space, particularly around food, as foods are often connected to health behaviors um, and health concerns. The fact that SNAP has been made available for online shopping um, also raises concern about um, access to foods and who and what marketing techniques will be used um, in these uh, populations. And an area that I didn't appreciate until trying to build an online grocery shopping platform for experimental purposes and then was confirmed um, by talking with Sean and, and knowing about his work with Jennifer, it became clear that the regulatory environment about labeling is a lot more complex um, than I had understood. And so I would like to hand it over to Sean to pick up on uh, the issue of labeling on online grocery shopping. Sean? Great. Thank you, Norbert, for your presentation. I want to remind everyone that we will have some time to answer questions at the end of our session, and you can pose your questions at any time in the GoToWebinar control panel that should be on the side of your screen. I'll now continue our presentations by introducing our work on food labeling and online groceries. 
Specifically, I want to talk about how the information provided in food labels that are required by law to be part of the package packaging of food items for sale in conventional groceries. It's not often available in online grocery stores. I'll first present on our recent work trying to characterize the current state of affairs, and then my co-author and colleague Jennifer Pomerantz will tell you about the legal analysis she conducted also as part of this work. Next slide, please. Dr. Wilson nicely summarized the spectacular growth in online grocery shopping in recent years. This rapid growth has outpaced federal regulatory attention to the online provision of nutrition and allergen information historically required on food product labels. Much of US food labeling regulations are based in an expectation that consumers can inspect food packaging to access mandated guidance, such as the Nutrition Facts Panel, and then can use this to make informed purchasing decisions based on data provided in a consistent manner. This is obviously not true in an online store, and these settings raise new questions regarding who is responsible for ensuring that consumers can access the information. Historically, and still now, the responsibility lies with the manufacturer of the food. The problem is that even when the packaging contains the required information, nothing in current regulations require that it be visible to an online consumer. As such, we set out to investigate this question by assessing the current practice of online grocery stores in providing, or failing to display, this information and also to assess the feasibility of policy options available to regulators under existing statutory authorities. We also designed this work to inform an ongoing project that will track the evolution of online retailers' practices in this area, including their compliance with any regulatory or, for that matter, voluntary standards that may arise in the future. Next slide, please. In the short time I have available to me today, I'll only be able to briefly describe our work, so I would encourage anyone who would like to see the full study to reach out to me over email and I'll gladly send along a copy. Next slide, please. Let me provide a few concrete examples of what we were looking for in this study. Here's an example of an organic hot dog sold by Amazon. As you can see here, the text of the web page does not include the nutrition facts panel that does actually appear on the packaging as required by law. And no, the information also doesn't exist if you click on the show more display link displayed here on the right hand side. You'll also see that this product contains thumbnails of pictures displaying use cases for the product and even some of the labeling information. For this particular product, we thought it was interesting that even though the federally regulated nutrition facts panel does not appear in the photos, the voluntary non-GMO project verified label is included. Whether by accident or design, this retailer is privileging access to voluntary information over mandatory information. Next slide, please. And it's worthwhile to note that online platforms can also provide opportunities to provide more information to consumers, perhaps even in surprising ways. For example, there is no requirement for fresh produce to display a nutrition facts panel, either in bulk or if sold in packaging. But as you can see on this screenshot from Walmart's online store, they have chosen to provide nutrition information for Granny Smith apples in the format of a nutrition facts panel on the text of their web page. Next slide, please. So why might such inconsistencies matter? To begin with, nutrition and health labeling do make a difference. Well done scientific reviews incorporating data from several studies into meta-analyses have shown that food labels do indeed make a difference at the population level. So not having this information undermines public health. And of course, for individual shoppers who might otherwise be trying to pay attention to things like high sodium or other nutrients or ingredients with which they have specific problems, this can be quite harmful. The difficulty in finding mandatory allergen information on some products could actually pose severe risks to the most sensitive consumers. And finally, note the type of variations in what is currently being presented that I just showed in my last two examples. In the absence of mandatory standards, retailers might choose to provide strategic what to provide strategically. For example, providing NFP only for healthier products and not less healthy ones, or to some consumers and not others. Having a consistent standard of some sort at least provides a least common denominator as to what all consumers can access for all products. Next slide, please. So our specific study focused on common packaged foods from th the three categories most purchased by SNAP participants, bread, cereal, and drinks, and on nationally available brands. We looked across nine large online retailers, including the eight that participate in the SNAP online purchasing pilot mentioned earlier, plus Stop and Shop, a prominent supermarket chain that uses the popular Peapod online platform. These products and stores were chosen before we collected any data. We were not trying to cherry pick bad actors or problematic products. For our chosen products and retailers, we looked at four categories of mandatory information, the nutrition facts panel, the ingredients list, common allergens, and the percent juice for fruit drinks. We also noted the presence of voluntary and nutrition, health and nutrition related claims on either images of the product packaging 
or in the text of the web page itself. Next slide, please. In order to perform our analysis, we spent quite a bit of time collecting images for each item in Retailer, as it was necessary to capture all the items that might be available for clicking or scrolling. Here's an example of one image, uh, set of images collected in our database for one product on, in one retailer. Next slide, please. We also made sure to capture the full size of Im image of everything that might only be visible by hovering over a thumbnail image, such as the Nutrition Facts panel image that accompanied these Capri Sun fruit pouches. We created the database so that all subsequent coding could be checked for accuracy and so that we can also refer to these images moving forward to track the evolution of these practices over time. Next slide, please. It's important to highlight that our study was not designed to call out individual stores as good or bad actors, as we are not claiming to have included a representative sample of all products being sold. However, the patterns we did see within our sample of products and stores is quite useful in characterizing the inconsistencies that motivated this work. In our analysis, we coded each information item as present, conspicuous, and legible only if it existed on the page, could be accessed without clicking or scrolling, and could be read without modifying the image. For example, you can see here that for Honey Nut Cheerios, this was true for only 11.1%. That is one out of the nine retailers included. We also present in our results a percentage of time for which an item was not present at all, regardless of where one might look, scroll, or click. Again, for Honey Nut Cheerios, the information was not available in any way for one third of the included retailers. Next slide, please. So some key takeaways from our work included that all six of our, across all six of our information categories, we found that this information was present, conspicuous, and legible on average only 36.5% of the time across the product and retailers included. Perhaps the most problematic in our work was that we saw potential allergens were clearly indicated on only about 11.4% of the included products, and unfortunately were completely absent more than half of the time. Finally, we also noted that voluntary health and nutrition claims, such as low sodium or low fat, were more frequently included in product images than were the required nutrition facts panel and ingredient lists. In a minute, Jennifer Pomerantz will share with you the results of the legal scan she conducted that looks at the tools available to regulators currently to, available some, uh, to address some of these inconsistencies. Next slide, please. As I already mentioned, this does matter. Labels make at least some positive difference to public health and are important, perhaps even life-saving tools for those consumers who are most in need of the information. And the current lack of standard means that retailers have the discretion to decide what or what not to show, regardless of what is on the packaging. We have no evidence in our study as to which of these omissions and inconsistencies might be by design or by accident. But given the vast amount of information available to online retailers about shoppers and their preferences, and how effectively they are already using these tools to market to us in other areas. The potential for this to be done with nutrition labeling in the absence of standards is undeniable. Next slide, please. To wrap up, let me note that, of course, the role of labels in the marketplace goes well, well beyond simply providing information to individual consumers who may or may not be interested. Of course, labels are only one source of information, and as we saw in the examples I shared, there's lots of information that can be, and already is, provided to consumers outside of the required on-package labels. We also know that labels set expectations, and then not everyone responds to labels in the same way. Given that online retailers have amazingly powerful tools for differenti differentiating consumers at their disposal, this is somewhat, something that we can expect can and will be a powerful tool for marketing moving forward. Finally, labels often have a bigger influence on producer behavior than on consumers. Take, for example, the wave of reformulation that took place when trans fat labeling was included in the Nutrition Facts panel. The current inconsistency in label provision in online environments can only undermine the ability of requirements to influence such product formulation decisions. Next slide, please. So now I'll turn things over to Jennifer Pomerantz and ask her to continue this discussion by talking about how these inconsistencies could be addressed under current statutory authority already afforded to federal agencies. Please go ahead, Jennifer. Thank you so much, um, and thank you for everyone for attending. I will be discussing our legal analysis of, of the same study that Sean just went over. Next slide, please. So we know that Congress can always act and pass a law that's not inconsistent with the Constitution. Um, but at the time that we uh, conducted our study, Congress hadn't even proposed a bill on the topic. However, we did uh, find one since, which I'll mention at the end of, of my talk. 
But there are, my research question was actually thinking about what current authorities that the federal agencies might have to enforce labeling online for these online retailers that are lacking uh, consistent disclosure of the required information. So three federal agencies are relevant to this, the Food and Drug Administration or the FDA, the Federal Trade Commission or the FTC, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture or the USDA. Next slide, please. First, turning to the FDA, this um, is probably, uh, everyone is very familiar with seeing this on our product labeling. These are the required information on the left, the nutrition facts panel, ingredient list, and allergens. Then on the right is just an example of a front of uh, the package label where we would find those voluntary claims that Sean just mentioned, which we did find were more present often than the required information, which is things on the left. Uh, one thing to note that we also looked at in addition to the, these three required um, areas was also the percent juice in uh, fruit drinks. So those were the four areas that we were trying to capture for the required information. So everyone really thinks about this as something that's required on the, pro on the product packaging itself. But actually, FDA law applies to labeling as well. Next slide, please. So the term label and labeling are both used in the regulations and labeling is defined as written, printed or graphic matter accompanying the product. Most people think of this as something like a shelf tag. So a tag that is under the product when you're perusing the store shelves, not something you would think of online. However, the Supreme Court analyzed a case of labeling well before there was online retail and explained that if it performs the same function as a label, as if it were on the container, it, it does meet the definition of labeling. And all cases and interpretations of FDA regulations have found the same thing, that if it's performing the same function as a label, it, it would be considered labeling for FDA regulations. So clearly the um, online supermarket, the images that they're showing does perform the same function as a label. Um, and also FDA regulations require that all required information be prominently placed and with such conspicuousness as to render it likely to be read and understood by consumers under the customary conditions of purchase. These are the customary conditions of purchase are now online shopping. And that's why we analyze conspicuousness and prominence in, in addition to presence, because that is how it's supposed to be displayed. Um, so if one were to conclude that FDA regulations, uh, the concept of labeling in, in captures the online retail space, then we would, it's easy to conclude that these products should be already displaying the full information panel. And it's also important to note that Congress enacted labeling requirements in general based on the concept that the informed consumer is essential to the fair and efficient functioning of a free market economy. And so for both for economic terms and legal concepts of the First Amendment, labeling disclosures really support our um, free market and, and an efficient marketplace. So it, it, it really does um, support the notion that this labeling should be disclosed already. So moving on to the FTC, please, the next slide. The FTC's authority is has a consumer protection authority, and they uh, address false, deceptive, and unfair acts or practices. And this applies to all different types of advertising, online sales, online advertising, et cetera. So unfair is defined as an act or practice that causes or is likely to cause substantial injury to consumers, which is not reasonably avoidable by consumers themselves are not outweighed by countervailing benefits to consumers or competition. Deception is defined as a representation, omission, or practice that is material and likely to mislead a consumer. This would be analyzed from the perspective of a consumer acting reasonably under the circumstances. So the retailer's failure to provide required information may be deemed to be both unfair and deceptive. It's certainly a material omission because it is likely to mislead consumers to purchase products they may not have otherwise purchased. Also, the, the current state of, of unclarity, whether something's either being disclosed or missing, such as allergens, which was something that was pretty surprising to us, 
um, makes, makes this deficiency unavoidable. And this is especially concerning for consumers who have limited shopping options, either due to their location, for example, a rural area, or if they're SNAP participants using an approved SNAP retailer. Um, there's also a potential for health harm and for safety harm for allergens and other things like sodium or sugar, which are, are of course related to hypertension and diabetes. And then a reasonable consumer may not have purchased these products had they had the required information. So, so this is um, this does seem to under you know meet the definitions of unfair and deceptive. Next slide, please. In terms of the USDA, the USDA has um, authority over SNAP retailers. They have the authority to uh, identify factors and considerations to designate which stores are authorized to accept and redeem SNAP benefits. The definition of SNAP retail food store already includes online food entities. And uh, at, at the last time we looked at this, 48 states had provided uh, SNAP online retail stores for their SNAP participants. So the USDA would seem to have the authority to be able to require that in order to qualify as a SNAP retailer you, uh, for online SNAP retail, that the SNAP retailer themselves must display the inf information panel clearly and um, legibly uh, and consistently. So the USDA would have the authority to make this a requirement for SNAP retailers. Uh, next slide, please. So in all in all, the retail authorities uh, would lead to these different types of um, regulatory activities. FDA can issue regulations. The FDA and FTC can work together to issue warning letters if they deem that this their, regula their current regulations are being violated or guidance, guidance documents to the um, commercial entities, if, again, if they think that their current regulations are being violated. If the FTC uh, believes that the practices are unfair or deceptive, they can bring cases against the commercial entities. And then the USDA can issue new retail regulations for online SNAP retailers. Next slide, please. And then I mentioned that the, um, the Congress, some members of Congress have um, proposed a bill that would require the um, online sale of food to have information available. As you can see, this is the excerpt here, line six through 10. Um, the goal was to require disclosure of the information panel for online retail sale. This was introduced in August of 2021. It didn't go forward. Um, and it, what it would do is modify the original code of, for misbranded food. So what that would mean is that if a retailer sold food without disclosing the required information, it would be deemed misbranded. And so that's what, how the, this would have uh, changed the regulations. And so some representatives and senators from New Jersey, Connecticut, Illinois, Connect, um, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts introduced this, and hopefully they will do it again um, this term and see where that can go. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, thank you very much. This is my email address. Feel free to email me and I look forward to the Q&A now here. Thank you. I have a quick word of thanks to offer our partners. This and other seafarer programming wouldn't be possible without the continuing support of the Agricultural and Applied Economics Association. The United States Department of Agriculture's National Agricultural Statistical Service, as well as the department's Economics Research Service. Thank you to all of our sponsors. Next slide. I'd also like to give a big thank you to Norbert and Jennifer be, for being part of our panel today. Lastly, we'd like to thank you, the audience. We're passionate about this subject and hope that you are too, but we realize it's not a small thing to give up an hour of your time to spend it with us. We hope you enjoyed this event as much as we enjoyed hosting it. Thanks so much and have a great day.